first of all, what uh, what is the most important when we have to introduce the notion of semantic formation or what uh, could be semantic communication? Uh, we have, in fact, uh, to uh, keep in mind that maybe the most important ingredient is the language. Everything is based on a language, which is a kind of uh, summary uh, of uh, many, many different informations. And in this summary, you keep whatever you want. It can be uh, maybe uh, uh, the uh, raw aspects. It can be something related to a goal. I think you have all heard uh, about uh, goal-oriented uh, communication. So you can have a goal in mind and all aspects uh, related to this goal, uh, then you can keep them. And so you have this uh, summary, which is given by your language, right? And uh, in fact, you know, um, when you deal with a language, it's very different uh, of uh, what you are doing, for example, if you're using, uh, I don't know, signal processing or, or these kinds of techniques, it's very, very different. And if you want to deal with a language, you need the proper mathematical tools. And it, in this um, second part, I will introduce part of them and uh, will uh, explain to you how they can intervene uh, in this uh, notion of semantic information. Okay, so very quickly, I remind you the language of uh, uh, Carnap and Barilel. So you had uh, a language called the LN pi with n subjects uh, uh, and the pi different attributes. Each attribute, let's say attribute number i, can take uh, possibly pi i values, all right? Then we described the, the notion of state descriptions, which is very important. The state description, in fact, uh, is a, a proposition very precise with no ambiguity that associates to each uh, uh, subject uh, a value for each attribute, all right? So it's the most precise thing that you can imagine. And then by starting from these state descriptions, you can form different other propositions by using this junction, so which is the or negations, or if you go to something more complicated, you can also have the conjunctions, the end, etc. So now just to give you, let's say, some orders of magnitude. This is a chi is the number of possible state descriptions for this language. And two to the power k is the total number of propositions that you can form from there. And for example, if you have four subjects, uh, two different attributes, three values for the first attributes and two values for the second attributes, you can already have a very big language where the number of possible proposition is much bigger than the total number of atoms in the visible universe. So, I mean, this is just to give you an idea of how complex it can be at the end. And that's why we needed to invent uh, some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, summary of this language, all right? So, and what Carnap and Barilel have done, so this was uh, also in the last uh, uh, lecture that they gave. So, they, in fact, introduced an axiomatic notion of set valued information that they called IN of P, like information of P, where P is a given proposition in their language. So that means that the, the information measure, the semantic information measure that they gave has values in a set. It's not like in Shannon theory where, in fact, for example, the entropy of, let's say, random variable is a number. Here, no, it's not a number, it's a set, okay? And then they propose a construction of a set value notion, which they call the content, and which satisfied the axioms of this IN, right? right? And then finally, maybe they were a little bit afraid of dealing with a, a set valued uh, notions of information. So then they proposed that numerical values corresponding to these notions IN and COMT, right? And uh, which is basically, this number is basically uh, the number of state descriptions that you need to describe your proposition of interest, okay? So that means that uh, in fact, 
this notion of semantic information just depends on how many, uh, if you consider the numbers, how many state descriptions you need. Or if you look at the, the, the set value, the uh, information measures, it is, let's say, this description that uh, uh, is important and nothing else. But uh, just by showing this example that I showed yesterday, uh, sorry, last week, it was uh, maybe one of the last uh, uh, slides that I showed you. What is interesting is that this uh, Carnap and Barilel language can apply, in fact, to, for example, uh, classification tasks in AI. And for example, um, as input, you know, you have an image, which is a collection of pixels. So uh, uh, the subjects are the pixels. You have three attributes, the three uh, uh, primary colors, RGB, and then they take value among 256 possible gray levels, for example, all right? And so that means that already a typical state description is of this form. So the red part of pixel 11 has a value 153 and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it's a kilometer long formula if you consider uh, normal images, of course. And this is just for state descriptions. Now, the other propositions you have to know are disjunctions of state descriptions. So that means that uh, it's impossible to describe by using just this machine language, what I call machine language, because then, of course, from there, you need something to uh, uh, have some uh, more interesting information. And this something is, for example, a DNN, right? Which, for example, if you are just interested in knowing if uh, the image represents a flower or not, then suddenly the new language becomes much, much, much poorer uh, because you have basically just one word, which is flower, and you have to say if it is true or false that it's a flower, right? And uh, so, and for, for doing that, of course, you have the, 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 the DNN that we, a train DNN that will accomplish this, uh, this task, all right? So, as you can see, also, when you are going from uh, the input layer of uh, uh, the DNN, for example, to the last layer, in fact, you have still at each layer, you have a kind of language, but this language becomes poorer and poorer. This is the first thing to know. But at the same time, you have more and more interesting information for you. So that means that you have more and more semantic information related to that. All right? So, and uh, what I want to show you is how this works in a simple example to start with. All right. So uh, let's uh, stop here this reminder from uh, the first presentation and let's go to the second one. All right. Can you see my second presentation? Is it okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, so let's start uh, still uh, with uh, something uh, uh, very uh, uh, easy to start with, of course, which is what I call the case of exchangeable attributes. And we will see that there is uh, some algebraic structure that can act on this. I will show you why and how. So on the left, you have uh, an array, which is in fact, uh, the example that has been used in the Carnap and Barilel paper. So it's uh, uh, just a special case of their general language where you have three subjects, A, B, C, two attributes, age and gender, and uh, two values for each attribute, male and female for the gender, and young and old for the age. So it's, it's very simple, right? Okay, now, suppose that you have, uh, uh, so wh what are the assumptions here? When I say, for example, gender, I mean, it's not the gender as we can know. It doesn't carry all the semantics of all the, our semantics, let's say, of the word gender. It's in fact, for this language, male or female is exactly the same thing. It does, I mean, you have no specificity in being male or being female. And the same applies to the age. You have, there is no specificity in being male or, uh, sorry, in being old or in being uh, young, 
All right. So that means, what does it mean? It means that there is a semantic content that appears now beyond the set of theoretic um, uh, context developed by Carnap and Marilel. So we have already some semantic uh, uh, content that says that first of all, all subjects are equivalent. You can permute them, it's not a problem. So A, B, C, uh, I mean, you can say B, A, C, it's the same. I mean, it doesn't change anything. Same for the attributes, gender and age do not carry the semantic content that we give, give to them. And it's the same for the values of the attribute, young, old, or male, female, all right? What does it mean? It means that there is a group of permutation that acts on this language. It is what I will call the Galois group of the language because it is in the same vein as the Galois group in Galois theory. It is something, a group that acts on a set. In this case, the set is the language, all right? So how does it work? So you have, in fact, uh, first of all, the subjects and the attributes are independent. There is no specific relations between ABC on one side and the fact of being male, female, or whatever, right? So that means that we can focus first on the subjects and then on the attributes, all right? So for the subject, in fact, uh, the group of permutations of the subject is a sigma three, which is just uh, the group of permutations of a set uh, uh, containing three elements, that's it, all right? So it's a group with uh, six elements because you have six permutations of three elements. So that's it, nothing, um, nothing special. All right, for the attribute, it's a little bit uh, 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 more difficult because you have uh, two pairs of attributes and each attribute is binary, okay? That means that you can exchange, for example, the age, A1, A2. You can exchange the genders, G1, G2. And you can exchange also the attributes between themselves, all right? So what does it mean? It means that it is as if, how to say, as if you had a square, right? The vertices of the square being the pairs of attributes, that means male old, female old, male young, female young, all right? So you can see them at the, as vertices of the square, and then you want to find the symmetries of the square. But the symmetries of the square, we know them very well because it is a group that is called the dihedral group D4, where you have inside, which is generated by the rotations of angle multiple of pi over two and the two uh, symmetries with respect to the two axes, vertical and horizontal, all right? So, that means that, uh, in fact, uh, we have basically two groups, one acting on the subjects, this is sigma three, and another one, which is D4, acting on uh, the attributes. So because the subjects and the attributes are independent, then the Galois group of the language will be the direct product of sigma three and D4, right? Which means that you can represent an element of G as a pair where the first component is in sigma three and the second one in D4. Now we can say, uh, let's say within the new mathematics that we will need to understand all that, that the language is a pre-sheaf over the group G. So pre-sheaf is a, a term that I will explain to you a little bit more in detail uh, afterwards because it's really uh, uh, the basis of all that. So, we have identified, uh, for example, just as examples, uh, in this language, four possible for different orbits under the action of this group, all right? So the first one is an orbit. Uh, uh, so an orbit, uh, you, you know what it is when you make a group act on some elements, all right? Then uh, you look at all the images uh, 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 under the action of all elements of the group and it makes an orbit, all right? So in this case, look, we have the four uh, first uh, rows of this array. As you can see, in this case, you have the first row is A, B, C are male and young. 
The second one is A, B, and C are male and old, then A, B, and C are female and young, and then finally A, B, and C are female and old. So it's a disjunction of four state descriptions. If I consider all of them, that means case number one or case number two or case number three or case number four, right? But this can be formulated by using, uh, for example, the natural language. In another way, it can be formulated as all subjects have the same attributes. All right, so instead of using, you know, this disjunction form, which is uh, very bad, you can change the language. It is exactly what deep neural networks are doing when you are uh, traveling through the layers of the deep neural networks. The language is changing. And at the end, it corresponds, uh, let's say, to the language uh, of uh, the question that you ask or the task that you asked to the neural network to answer or to do. So that's, uh, uh, you know, so the, the, this change of language is not just theoretical, it's something really happening, right? And uh, this is exactly type one, uh, can be translated in this uh, sentence, all these subjects have the same attributes, that's it, all right? Then you have a little bit more complex orbits, you have an orbit with a 24 element, a type two, which corresponds to the sentence, all the subjects have the same attributes, except one which differs by only one aspect. So that's a little bit tricky, but you know, in general, um, let's say uh, the more elements your orbit has and uh, the more tricky sentence uh, it corresponds to, you know? So that's uh, very, uh, very amazing uh, as uh, it's just an observation. Uh, uh, we couldn't, of course, establish uh, a proof of it in the natural language because it's, uh, I mean, I'm not even sure that the natural language can be uh, modeled in a mathematical way, of course, etc. Then you have type three, where you have an orbit of 12 elements, which correspond to one subject is opposite to all the other ones. And uh, type four is, uh, yeah. So these are the four uh, typical orbits that we can have by using this uh, language. So how to say? Let's try to be uh, to go a little bit uh, uh, beyond that. Let's consider this. You know, the what is on the right, the figure on the right. You can see, you can recognize the famous uh, vertices that I told you about the square: young male, old male, old female, and young female. I wanted to, in fact, characterize the type one orbit. One, so which means uh, all subjects have the same attributes. What does it mean? It means either all subjects have attribute male old or male young or female old or female young. So that's why we need to represent them by using this kind of figure. All right, and then so the the, the objects that you have are the four possible pairs of uh, attributes. And then you have something else. Then you have, in fact, the arrows. The arrows, in fact, correspond to the action of the Galois group. So some of the actions send one object to another one, but some other actions send an object to itself. Like, I mean, for example, if you consider the whole group, which is the product of sigma three and C2, so C2 is uh, just the cyclic group of uh, order two. So it's basically, it's, uh, it is the same as uh, zero one with the binary addition, right? So in this case, what does it mean? It means that if you exchange a subject, I mean, if you start uh, from, a from a situation where all subjects have the same attributes and you permute the subjects, uh, it, if uh, at the origin all subjects are old and male, and if you permute the subjects, you will still have all subjects are old and male. It will not change anything. Are you okay? That's fine. So that's why, of course, you don't change uh, these objects. Now, you have, so this is, uh, this corresponds to the action of sigma three on the subjects. Now you have the action of C2 on the subjects. What is the action? In fact, the action is just uh, the permutation of uh, the attributes. That means that, instead of uh, having, uh, let's say, gender age, you have age gender. So uh, having all male or male all doesn't change anything, all right? So that's why 
of course, in this case, uh, this group C2 is also within what is called the stabilizer, which is the group that sends each object onto itself. So what you have is that the stabilizer of all objects are isomorphic. That means that basically they are the same group. Okay. And but then what is interesting is in fact the arrows that send the objects, so the, the, the pairs of attributes from one situation to another one. For example, uh, let's say for going from old female to young female, you had to use in fact the group C2, so it's a still a binary, um, uh, it's a still a, a, a binary group that sends, so of course, one element of the group is always the identity. So this one, I don't take it into account, but the non-trivial element will send the attribute value old onto the attribute value young. And that's why you go from old female to young female. All right, yeah. So now the situation is well summarized within this figure. But you have to know that there is a branch of mathematics which is called the category theory, all right? And this kind of diagram where you have objects and the rows that can be composed and where all rows are invertible because they are coming from a group, so where all elements are invertible. So this thing, this diagram, corresponds to what is called in category theory a groupoid. That means a category where all rows are invertible, all right? And you have to know that if we go further even, uh, these groupoids in fact correspond in some sense that I will not explain too much here because it will uh, I mean, take too much time. So the group eight can be also seen as a topological space where in fact, the points of the space are just the objects and the rows correspond to the path that you can form within your topological space. So the continuous path that you can form. So in this case, this topological space is very simple because it's finite, there's only four points and that's it, all right? So this thing that works for um, the situation type one where uh, we can translate it into the sentence, all the subjects have the same attributes, also work for type two, type three, and type four, all right? So in this case, you will have still a groupoid because everything is coming from a group in this situation. And um, I have to say, so you will have uh, uh, 24 or 12 objects instead of four, and then you will have the arrows, the stabilizer, which send one object to itself, and the, uh, the, 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 the rows that will send uh, also one object to a different one. So this is something quite, uh, uh, quite interesting because really from there, from this, uh, in fact, for this proposition, for example, here, all objects have the same attribute, you can make a correspondence between the proposition and a space. Because as I told you, a groupoid can be seen as a topological space, all right? So in this case, it's quite simple because you only have a rows, simple rows. But instead of simple rows, you can also have a rows of rows, et cetera, et cetera. And you can, of course, uh, go uh, to infinity uh, by, by, by using these kinds of construction. If you consider some very difficult languages, for example, and in this case, instead of considering groupoids, you have another notion, which is, a, which is called the infinity groupoids. So which is the, 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 the right notion uh, in the general case. But in this simple case, just the one groupoid is enough. So when you have only objects and the rows between objects, that's it. All right. So as I told you, you can do the same here with the four other types, the three other types, sorry. And then by using these junctions or conjunctions and using some topological construction, so it's something we have done. I will not present this here because it takes too much time to understand all the principle. Uh, you can in fact associate finally to each proposition of this language, you can associate 
space. And we say that this space is a space of information. As you can see, for example, in this case, but it is a case also for the other proposition. Remember what I told you in Carnap and Barilel case, right? You had a notion of set of inform sorry, of set valued information measure, where basically you had in your set the um, state descriptions that you need to use, uh, yeah, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, let's say to form your sentence to form your proposition here in fact it is the same because for if you want to consider all uh, uh, subjects have the same attributes that it needs that you need to describe um, uh, the, the, the attributes and it corresponds exactly to the four first rows of this array that means that you have as many objects as you need a state description. So the set theoretic part is the same, but you have something more. You have the space. That means it corresponds to all the rows that form, you know, this continuous path between the points of your set, between the elements of your set, all right? So it's much, much, uh, uh, more valuable than just considering sets. But you have to know that in 52, when Cardinal and Barilel uh, uh, wrote this paper, all these tools didn't exist. Of course, group theory was existing, but uh, not this uh, correspondence with sets, etc. All right? So just maybe we need to go to some, I will present uh, uh, quickly uh, the general settings that we need to go beyond the Carnap and Barilel language and to consider languages that are a little bit more complex. First of all, I, I talked with you about uh, groups. I will show you that a group is a category, in fact. Yeah. And uh, yeah. What, what, what are the categories? So, category is very simple. You have a collection of objects. So, as it was the case for, group, for the group OE that I've introduced to you, and you have a rows. Uh, yeah. And it has to satisfy some rules. The first one is that the composition of morphisms or of rows exists and is associated. So you don't need any parentheses to compose your rows. All right. For example, here, if you go from this object, sorry, from this object to this one and then to this one, it needs that there exists the composition of F1 and F2 which is F2 circle F1, and which is represented by this row. And then you always have an identity. So in this case, it's just the loop that you have on each object. You always have, so it was the case in, for group weights, for example, the, these axioms are clearly satisfied. So you have uh, many types of uh, categories, I mean, um, which can be more or less uh, interesting. So the first one is the category of sets. Yes, if you consider all possible sets, it's a category. So it's a big one, of course, because you have basically all sets. So the objects are sets and the arrows are functions uh, between sets, all right? So this is the first example, which is a very important one, of course. You can also consider the category of topological spaces where objects are topological spaces, arrows are continuous functions, right? So I will not uh, spend too much time on this. Then on, on top of categories, you have also a very important notion, which is the notion of functors. So there is a US mathematician, John Bez, who, who said uh, every sufficiently good analogy is yearning to become a functor. That's right, because in fact, uh, a functor, let's say, will be a mapping between two categories that tries uh, to keep uh, uh, the, 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 the structure of the category. So that means that it's a kind of uh, transport, of semantic transport, because we'll see that categories can uh, carry semantics. So it's a kind of semantical transport between uh, uh, two categories, all right? So the definition is uh, very simple. It's a map between two categories C and D that has to satisfy those two constraints. First of all, it maps the identities of each object 
x of c into the identity of f of x, which is the object, uh, uh, which is the image of uh, uh, x by the functor. And then it uh, respects the composition of a rows. That means that capital F of G circle F is F of G circle F of F, all right? That's it, there is nothing else. And then you can, of course, define some more interesting notions, which is uh, what is called the adjunct functors, which in fact will give the best approximation, uh, uh, let's say, of uh, the semantical content of one category on the other one. So it's, uh, uh, I mean, you can do many, many different things by just considering the very general structural level. You, in fact, uh, man manipulating categories means exactly uh, being at a very general level, never entering the details. So you can see many things that you couldn't see if you were, uh, let's say, uh, going into too much details. Very quickly, and uh, I'm sorry for that. I have no time uh, to really uh, uh, expose to you what is uh, a sheaf. So, in fact, uh, uh, you start with uh, what is called a small category C. So, sheaves have been invented by uh, a French mathematician, Jean Loret, uh, when he was uh, in uh, German camps during uh, World War II. So, it's, uh, and uh, so, uh, it's, uh, it's just a functor. What is called a contravariant functor, that means that contravariant means that you invert uh, the direction of the arrows of the category C. This is what it means, all right? So you take a category C and then any functor that goes from the category C to the category of sets is called a pre -sheaf. That's it. So you have to keep in mind that a pre is a functor. Uh, okay, what follows? I don't want to expose it today because it's very difficult to really well understand. Uh, it's how to make pre sheaves being sheaves. In fact, it's a notion of gluing. Let's say that, uh, how to say, uh, if you consider the collection of all pre sheaves, all right, then some of them will become a sheaf under what is called the Grothendieck topology, all right? And uh, uh, it's a kind of, in fact, you will consider only pre sheaves that allow you to glue some notions under the Grothendieck topology, all right? So it's a little bit uh, vague what I'm saying, but uh, I'm sorry, I cannot be more precise for now, that's, uh, yeah. And uh, this gluing is very, very important because it is by doing this gluing that you are able to, that a notion, a concept is able to rise uh, in, uh, in semantics, all right? Okay. Then if you consider the collection of all possible sheaves, you get a topos. So it's a notion invented by Grothendieck in the 60s. Uh, how to say, <clears throat> there are still many people who uh, um, are not convinced by this notion of a topos. But I have to say that it's a super important notion which can allow you to mix many, many different aspects of a common concept. For example, the geometrical aspects, the logical aspects, etc. All of them are within this notion of topos. It's, you, you can see on the right what Alexander Grothendieck was saying about his notion of topos for him. And uh, I have to say that uh, I have been convinced that this notion was the, 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 the right one uh, when I started working on, on that, that was the right one to understand these notions of semantic and also uh, what maybe could be a true artificial intelligence, not uh, the uh, statistical ones that we know uh, nowadays. 
Okay, so just very quickly, some example of topos. The first one is a category of sets because in fact, a topos is a category. So the category of sets is also a topos. It is the simplest one you can imagine. That means that all other toposes are bigger and even much bigger than the category of set, which includes all possible sets. So you can see that, I mean, it's, uh, it's something uh, uh, very, very hard to imagine and also uh, to manipulate. That's why we never manipulate toposes, but we only manipulate representations of toposes, all right? So the small category we start with with sets is just a one object category with the identity morphism and that's it, there is nothing else. And then the sh you construct pre-shifts, which are in fact shifts in this case. And uh, you know, what does it mean? It means that you have to imagine a functor that goes from this uh, one object category to the category of sets, all right? So you can send that this single object has to be sent to one set. And then the morphism that you have is the identity morphism and that's it. And you send the identity morphism to the identity of the set. So that means it's uh, strictly equivalent to the category of sets, all right? Because each sheaf is one set essentially. All right, that's it. Uh, in fact, there is something I didn't tell you. It is each topos has um, an internal logic. Uh, I will not say more about that uh, because uh, it's, uh, but uh, many people, uh, many mathematicians, if you're interested, can talk about that much more than, much better than myself. And if you're interested, I can find uh, someone who will, uh, uh, do a very, very nice uh, exposition of uh, these toposes. Okay, that means that there is only one point of view. Why? Because you have only one object in the initial category. But if you have more objects, then you can have many point of view. That means that this topos can have a semantics which is much, much richer than just the topos of set, which is the basic one. Uh, maybe this one I will not develop it because I don't have too much time. So then the topos of a group, which is very important. Okay, so our category is uh, this one, one object still, but it's not the same as the category of sets because you have now many, many rows that go from this object to itself. It is just the representation of a group as a category. All these rows are invertible. And so this is, for example, the representation of the cyclic group C3 which is basically, um, uh, this group consists, for example, it's, it can be represented by uh, uh, the addition of integers modulo three, that's it. So then if you consider, in fact, what is in interesting in groups, it is that Grothendieck pre-shift topos, because I mean, you don't need any Grothendieck topology. That means in this, the topology that we consider, all pre-shifts are shifts, so I uh, will not, um, um, I mean, that means it's much simpler that, than if you had a non-trivial uh, uh, Grothendieck topology. So what does it mean? It means that you have a functor, right? That goes from this group, for example, to the category of sets. It is what it means, <clears throat> all right? But if you look back at the definition, the actions that the functor has to satisfy, they are exactly the same as uh, uh, the axioms that what is called action of a group on sets has to satisfy. So that means that the topos of G sets, which is in fact the name that we use for this topos, is just the collection of all possible actions of a group G on sets. That's it, nothing else. All right, so this is very amazing. So that means that if you consider actions of a group, you obtain a topos, which is the topos of G set. And if you change it to the action of a more general category, then you will get something that basically nobody knows very well, which is the topos corresponding to that category. So basically all actions on sets can be in fact represented by a topos. That this is quite amazing which, and it is something that we will use right now. 
OK. Suppose that now, instead of having a group, uh, we have uh, a hierarchical language. <clears throat> For example, in this case, you see you have a kind of naive uh, phylogenetic tree, right? Where, in fact, uh, you go from the particular cat, dog, cow, grasshopper, oak, pine, to the very general notion of living being. All right, and then you go from the left to the right by following this tree, this let's say naive phylogenetic tree. All right, so now you can see that the notion of semantic information has to take into account this structure of a tree, or more generally, of a poset. A poor set means partially ordered set. That means you have an order. Here you have an order, which is uh, uh, which is obvious. Uh, for example, if you use the smaller uh, sign, you can say that cat is more than carnivorous, more than mammal, etc. And in uh, general poor set, you have uh, exactly the same thing, right? A poor set is a small category, and you may and you can make a poor set act on set. That means that as we have done with the Carnap and Barilel language, we can, in fact, consider now, you know, a language, if you want to capture the semantics of this structure of tree, I mean, you can then, in fact, see <clears throat> the language that will take into account this structure, right? So you can see this language as uh, pre sheaf on the tree category or more generally on the poset category. That means that languages will be elements, I mean, the, the, the sorry, sentences in this language will be elements of the topos that we will construct on as shifts on this category. So that means that you can take into account the hierarchy, the hierarchical property of this language. And then from there, you can construct, I will not do it because it's quite complicated with a poset. You can construct spaces of information in the same way we have done it for uh, the group of it that I showed you with the Carnap and Barilel language. All right, so that means in this case, if, the orbits, which is in fact the, the, what we, are co we were considering in the Carnap and Barilel language, still exist now. They have different properties because they are not defined by the action of a group, but, the, but by the action of a post set. And the orbits now, in fact, the coarser the language will become. So, for example, if you want to see what happens in, a, the, in a, a DNA, it is exactly that that, that happened. The coarser the language becomes when you go from one layer to the next one, and the larger the orbits become, because in this case, the classes that you will form, uh, for example, at the beginning, at the input layer, you have one class per image. But then when you are progressing, you can put many images into the same class, all right? And at the end, the classes will be, uh, as big, will be the biggest one compared to what you have uh, uh, during your progression in uh, the DNN. Something very important also, is that um, these orbits are very important because they can explain, in fact, some kinds of generalization, not all of them, because for some of them you need some metric structure. So I don't want to, 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 to discuss of it now. But the algebraic uh, generalization properties can be explained very easily through the famous orbits, you know? Why? Because in fact, for given task, let's say, if you have a group or maybe something, uh, some other category acting on a set, it means that, for example, here you have a set with x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, you know, these are the elements. And in red, you can see the actions of uh, the group on the element x1. So the identity sends x1 onto itself, and then the other elements of the group will send x1 to x2, to x4, to x3, to x5, etc. Yeah? Okay. If, in fact, the group acts, 
the right way compared to the language we are considering, what does it mean in terms of uh, AI or machine learning? It means that all the elements of this orbit will correspond to the same, exactly the same word, so the same element of language. That means that if you uh, design your neural network in order that, so that it has what is called equivariant layers within, then under the action of, for example, a group J, then it means that in this case, you don't need, during the training phase, you don't need to show too many elements, too many images to the neural network. Maybe very few of them will be enough because all the other ones that can be obtained by the action of the group G will be in fact processed inside the network and automatically, automatically you will get the same uh, response uh, to all elements of an orbit, all right? By the action of a group. It can be the same for any category. What is interesting also is that, you know, there is uh, this famous result of, uh, I mean, the famous universal approximation theorem uh, uh, for which, in fact, we have the first version by Sibenko in 1989, but there have been uh, some more general versions that have uh, popped up uh, uh, during the more, during more, uh, more recent years, right? Which is related to the approximation approximation of a function by a DNN. In this case, it was uh, on a space of continuous functions between two continuous space, whatever. We have, in fact, this approximation theorem that is valid for functions. What are functions? Functions are arose in the category of sets. That means that when you consider just functions, you are just considering sets. And this means that, of course, you forget what is called generalization. You forget the notion of semantic concept because if when I say, okay, what is uh, the semantic content of uh, some word, for example, of uh, the word cat, and you show me uh, millions of images of a cat, I will not be happy with that. This is the set theoretic way of considering this notion of a cat. But there are much more efficient ways of considering this for example, you have here some uh, results corresponding to G set. That means when you have a group acting on uh, the, for example, on, uh, on some uh, notion, right? On uh, the, 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 the points or the elements of some notions on some sets, yeah? Then you have to know, so that means if you are in the same situation as here, that means that you don't need basically to characterize during the training phase uh, to what each element corresponds, modulo some interpolation that will be done in the neural network. Um, here, because of the orbits, because of the action of the group G, then it's something uh, that will uh, 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 require much, much less training in order to, and then we, I mean, maybe not uh, in just the specific case of a group, it has to be much more general, but, at least you can have a more uh, uh, satisfactory way of defining a semantic content, all right? Through the semantic spaces corresponding here to this group G, or it can be something else. So you have a, a universal approximation theorem that has been established by Yarotsky in parallel and Joe the same year. And uh, uh, in this case, you need to implement what is called G equivalent maps within your, your your layers. So that means it's something that makes, let's say the action of the group and what the layer is doing a commute, let's say, all right? Uh, yeah, you can also define the action of a category on another category. It's a, we have a paper on that, uh, I will show you at the end. So uh, in this case, the notion of orbit generalizes and still, uh, what is interesting is that just with one data, you generate a whole orbit. That means that uh, you just need one point to have a global region. 
this is very interesting. We have found universal approximation theorems for post sets. Uh, okay, I will not uh, give any detail on what follows. Uh, also, there is something that I didn't say. We have also found that the equivalent of a universal approximation theorem for groupoids, uh, for the actions of groupoids, sorry. And what we conjecture is that probably a universal category that could allow us to really define in a very general way what uh, 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 this uh, semantic information measure could be for any kind of semantics uh, should be what uh, we call post sets fibered in groupoids. So it's something that makes basically everything, right? So you have the post set structure, which is hierarchical, and the groupoids, which is, of course, a kind of uh, <clears throat> which makes uh, uh, these orbits exist and uh, we, which is a, a very interesting uh, concept. Also, is there a theorem of semantic source coding? I think so. I hypothesis that such theorem, if it exists, will characterize the minimal amount of training data that is required to learn a proposition in the language L, all right? And uh, okay, then I don't want to spend too much time to be done many, many different things. What happens if you have a real logic, not just a language with a subjects attributes, but something with inference rules, uh, deduction rules, etc. cetera. And uh, there are also many other languages, even more complicated, Martinov intentional type theory, Luo modern type theory. In this case, what could be spaces of information? And what is interesting also, uh, and just I will finish with this, is that, uh, how to say, finding the right space of information is very important because the spaces of information, I'm sure of it, will give a way of implementing a very efficient uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, for example, a neural network uh, in order to to do what it has to do with the right language, let's say. All right. We have analogies also between shallow information theory and our new semantic information theory. Probabilities in shallow theory are equivalent to theories. So theories are propositions where you give it's a, where you give some axioms that mean this proposition is true this proposition is true and everything that you can deduce from these axioms in the language l is uh, is okay then you, you have also random variables are propositions a measure of ambiguity was the entropy here it's spaces of information and then uh, we have found also the equivalent of the fundamental equation i will not uh, go inside this because it's uh, it, it really requires uh, too many uh, uh, mathematics so uh, i will stop here and uh, so is mathematic theory of semantic communication conceivable yes probably but it's not easy at all we have uh, a paper since last summer on archive which is called topos and stacks of deep neural networks and uh, uh, we have also a new paper in pre preparation with Daniel Benkin, so my uh, quarter, which is a search of semantic spaces. So it's exactly what uh, I guess uh, we are looking for. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Claude. I don't know if uh, there is any question. I think it was, uh, uh, for my background, uh, not yeah. easy. <laughs> Sorry for that. It's, uh, not a mathematician, yeah. but I don't know, guys. Um, no, one thing, uh, Jean Claude, uh, when you were talking of um, uh, which are the information spaces, so I would like to ask you is that the road to go to something that can use practically semantic information yeah. solution? And uh, what would be the roadmap that you see in uh, to, to make this work? Uh, in fact, uh, there are. First of all, uh, uh, there are many applications. Uh, as I told you, in fact, the language is very, the, the notion of language is very general. Mm -hmm. It's not either natural language or the formal languages of computer science. 
is very, very, very general. I think that, for example, if you consider neural network at each layer, you have a language, you know? And uh, then, for example, if you consider classification tasks, then the language becomes a coarser and coarser when you progress uh, is it the, through the, the, the neural network, right? So uh, you have also, for example, uh, um, I think that uh, um, for people doing robotics, the notion of semantics is very important, of course. And uh, yeah, so, so uh, for, for us, in fact, uh, we are essentially uh, interested in, uh, in uh, 6G. It's also very important because for many reasons. First of all, we need to find a way for uh, uh, machines, intelligent machines to communicate. So that's why you need uh, to communicate many things. In fact, uh, you need, uh, I mean, you need to find, uh, first of all, a common language between two machines that need to communicate, uh, so, which corresponds to a common understanding, you know? And that means that, uh, um, I don't know what is the strategy, but for example, is you suppose that the transmitted machine uh, uh, needs uh, to teach its language to the other one, right? Because at the beginning, there is no reason they share the same language, they have the same understandings of uh, the different propositions, sentences, etc. So there is a first phase where, in fact, uh, uh, you need to, to send something so that the other machine will understand your your language uh, then. Uh, so, and uh, for this, you need to understand exactly what is uh, this notion of semantic information. And uh, as I told you, it's not uh, just uh, the, 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 the data of the training set, for example, right? It's not uh, also the weights of a neural network that has learned, that has been trained for some tasks. I mean, it can be that, but the problem is that, uh, how to say, it's uh, something that is uh, uh, too heavy by far away uh, compared to uh, the minimal amount of uh, uh, information to be exchanged uh, and that we need to, to, to find. And this notion of also of semantic information space is very interesting because, for example, <clears throat> Uh, in, in what I showed you, um, but as I said, it is really the beginning of the starting point of this area. It's uh, the, the, so uh, maybe in a couple of months we will have changed some <laughs> some ideas, some understanding, probably. But what I can say is that um, if you want to have something which go beyond what we have in artificial intelligence now. Maybe you, you have uh, probably uh, uh, watched uh, the, the talks of Benjo, for example, the system one, system two, you know, this kind of thing. So if you want to go from system one to system two, which is more about uh, uh, reasoning, understanding, etc., which is something that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, now nowadays neural networks uh, cannot do. I mean, they behave more like uh, parrots than uh, like uh, true intelligences, right? So, if you want to have this new AI uh, happens, uh, you need, uh, in fact, to understand that everything is not in the data. You need also the, 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 you, you need also either to uh, implement by yourself some very specific architecture. It is something that is already done. For example, if you consider CNNs, if you consider uh, RNNs of all types, uh, attention networks, uh, you know, all these things, they have a very specific architecture that allows for Blah, blah, blah. Some, you have also some kinds of layers that are equivalent to permutations, so to a group of, of permutation. You have also um, you, you, you have also some uh, um, uh, uh, neural network 
that can, I mean, uh, that uh, can be used, for example, for the, they are the, for example, the graph neural networks that are uh, equivalent to the exchange of uh, of, of, um, uh, of edges, etc. You know, all these things. Um, because, so either you do that, let's say, in hardware, let's say, yeah, uh, and you implement this a priori knowledge, or you use, I don't know, maybe some meta learning to understand how, so that the, but for now we are far away from there, so that the neural network can understand what to do, how to change its architecture as a function of what has to be done, which would be the next step, of course, all right? But that means that <clears throat> uh, the, these notions of semantic information spaces is really related to the notion of new AIs, let's say, if you are able to understand everything related to these uh, semantic information spaces, you will be mature enough to implement probably uh, neural networks that will be able to go much beyond what we're able to do now. So that's it's a uh, it's a kind of uh, for me uh, both aspects so these aspects of semantics on one side and of uh, let's say if I use the same words as Benjo and the aspect of system to uh, intelligence maybe are, are more less, are very connected. Yeah. Yeah, and, and one last thing, uh, and Lord, is, uh, do, do you see any other? Uh, potential tool for modeling uh, semantic information besides the doposes and uh, the shapes and all, all uh, you show it to... No, no, uh, yeah, no, no, I, I, I don't use schemes. <laughs> That's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, that, no, no, I mean, you, you can, uh, you, you can, uh, use you can no use... We thought that there was something else, which was the homotopy theory. But uh, the problem is that the homotopical equivalence is something too strong. Basically, it destroys uh, everything. <laughs> so there is something in the middle. But um, for now, I don't know. Because you, know, you have, in fact, uh, suppose that you're considering a, a, a neural network, right? We have, uh, it's in our common paper with Daniel Benke. Basically, you have three different levels. The first one is, uh, in fact, the category that corresponds to the, what we call the base, which is the architecture of the neural network without going too much into details. That means that you have uh, some layers, maybe you have uh, some other layers going to the, et cetera. I mean, it's basic architecture, all right? So then you have what we call the pre-semantics. So the pre-semantic is on the top, sorry. And uh, um, it characterizes specific layers that add some pre-semantic notion. For example, convolutional layers, LSTM layers, uh, you know, attention layers, all these layers which are very specific. And, uh, you know, so, and uh, this can be modeled by, in fact, uh, uh, what we call uh, 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 fibration and uh, it has, uh, and if it has some uh, nice property, then it is uh, what is called a stack. So, which corresponds to part of the title of our paper. And then on top of all that, you have the language, all right? And uh, so, basically, uh, what is being done is essentially a combination of all these three layers. You have to basically understand clearly how all these three layers behave and what is the interaction. 
uh, if you want uh, a more uh, geometrical image, right? So let's say that you're interested in a notion, a concept, all right? Then what we say is that it's, I mean, this notion, this concept has a shape because I, I showed you this semantic information measures, which were semantic spaces, all right? And the space, I mean, it's something with a shape, right? It comes from uh, from topology, so it's uh, there is a shape. So there is a shape which characterizes a semantic content, all right? So the semantic information. Okay. So <clears throat> when you consider just the base network, if you want to learn something, then in fact, uh, um, you have, uh, you are, in fact, what the neural network is doing is this. Uh, as I told you, you have this notion of post set fibered into viewpoints, which is exactly the way every neural networks we know behave nowadays. All right? That means you have uh, some layers. You can have also uh, connecting neural networks if you are considering, for example, uh, 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 modular neural networks or I mean, whatever. Uh, but each uh, layer can be very special. And uh, the way it is special is through this notion of pre semantics, right? And then you have on this layer, very special, you have in fact a kind of group of groupoid which is acting on it, all right? We have, for example, computed, so for the CNN it's very easy because the group is uh, the group of translations, uh, special translation. This, is, this has been known for a while, all right? But for example, for LSTM, we have been able to compute, it's not a group in this case, it's a groupoid. Um, and we have been able to characterize this, um, this uh, groupoid and the way it acts. So the, this is very interesting <clears throat> because it means that at each layers with these pre-semantics capabilities, then it is as if in, you, you, have, you don't have a point now, you have a kind of shape. You know, you aggregate points so that you can have, so these points that you are aggregating is just the orbits we were dealing with, you know? And then it becomes a shape, right? And what the neural network is doing thanks to its post-set structure is to glue all these uh, 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 small shapes all together to form something much bigger, which will be the final notion we need. I mean, and uh, so th th this is the way uh, it uh, it works when, because you know, uh, if you look at, uh, for example, your network, just in a very uh, analytic way uh, or signal processing or whatever, uh, then the problem is that we will, you will not be able to see basically uh, anything because you are too much considering the details. The power of these notions is really to see what's happening at a higher level. You forget all the details and then you look at a higher level. And from there, I mean, things become really much easier to understand. Okay. So, so as I told you, if there is uh, some other notions than topos, uh, yes, probably, but it has to be discovered yet. Because as I told you, it's between, uh, it's in fact, we need a notion of equivalence. Because what, what does it mean? It, it means that uh, uh, in, in simple cases, like the language of color parallel, it was very simple, no problem. But now suppose that uh, you want to characterize, uh, uh, let's say, a cat. So, and these equivalence is that all, uh, all objects that are cats will be recognized as cats, so will be equivalent all together, okay? But what kind of thing you can make act on all possible cats 
to have exactly, uh, I mean, to have the same, uh, uh, um, the same description as uh, we did for, uh, for example, the sentence, all subjects have the same attributes for this equivalence. For cat, uh, it may be much, much, much more complicated, of course. You know, and and then uh, so so you have at that level uh, where we 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 were conjecturing that maybe homotopy was enough, but it's not. Basically, homotopy destroys too much. Homotopy equivalence destroys too much. We need something, some second uh, order uh, invariant, not homotopy, in order to to keep, let's say, uh, because at the end, you know, uh, uh, basically if you use uh, uh, some kind of homotopy that uh, is uh, too restrictive, basically everything you know would be equivalent to a point. So it's not what we are looking for, definitely, you know? <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah. Okay. Um... I, I don't know, I, did, I forgot to say to the participants online that they could also ask questions through the chat. I don't know if uh, there is uh, anyone there. Uh, no, I don't see anything. No. Yeah, you, yeah, exactly. But I had forgotten at the beginning to say that they can also participate by asking questions directly in the chat. Uh, I would say, jean that uh, if you could share with, uh, with me the slides, uh, I will make them yes. uh, yes. uh, a yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. also, if you want to leave uh, some homework for us, so that we can study. And ah, them, okay. Yeah, I can think know. of and send you some references. Yes, if, yeah, if you're uh, interested. It will be, yes. be interesting for yeah, when yeah, you have a uh, deeper discussion with the guys here. Uh, yes, yes. Same time, uh, we also I also collected some other questions to WhatsApp by other colleagues, and uh, but I mean yeah. now I want to keep you. Longer, we can. Uh, I will forward to you by email, and we can open a discussion with them by email. Sure. Because it might be interesting specifically for ARC to to go deeper into the the concept of semantic information. Okay, so, no problem. Yeah.